Uh, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our uh, webinar, which is dedicated to the UK expertise in waste management. Please let me introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Uh, Deborah Sachs, Waste and Resource uh, um, uh, Resources Specialist at the Department for International Trade. Uh, Darren Sher, Assistant Director, Street Scene, Birmingham City Council, and Kenny Hall, Technical Sales Manager, uh, Manager in Hivercore. So I am pleased to pass the screen to Deborah. Thanks. Can you um, put the presentation up, or, yeah. or do I? The presentation is on air. Okay, there's the first slide. And there's a second slide. Great. Okay, we're, we're, we're going. So just to say hello, I work for the Department for International Trade, a colleague of Katya, who um, is our person on the ground. Um, and I am based in London, although working from home at the moment. And I'm just going to give a quick rundown of um, the way we do waste management in the UK and some of the uh, key issues that uh, you have to look at in order to make a system work. Um, and it's fairly high level. Um, but we can talk about some of the details when I think um, Darren and Kenny will, will perhaps talk uh, about some of the more day-to-day -day aspects. So um, I'm sure you've all seen this um, waste hierarchy, but just to um, always have it in your mind that uh, this is the way we approach waste management, which is to reduce, first of all, and try not to create waste and try not to overorder or buy things that you don't need or um, generate waste in the first place. If you do discard something or finish using something, see if it's got another use, so that's the reuse. Uh, if it breaks or um, could be re could be repaired, we'll have a look at that. And um, lots of, you know, it depends on the kind of products we're talking about, but often repair is a sort of big missing link in um, a lot of our modern material use. Um, and then recycling, which is really about collection and then reprocessing and making product materials into new products. Uh, recovery is about energy recovery um, and there's a whole stream of work about um, getting electricity and heat um, and then maybe chemicals from uh, materials that we have to um, that reach the end of their life and then uh, disposal is at the very end and we try and do as little as possible of that but there is still um, a need for waste disposal particularly of um, things like medical waste which there's a lot around at the moment or hazardous wastes um, and we can perhaps talk a little bit about uh, landfill and energy recovery. And uh, this slide is um, produced by an organisation called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and it talks about the circular economy. And um, it's really just to indicate that uh, if you want to do a bit more research, this is quite a, a, an interesting place to look, the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And they commissioned this diagram, which is the... Um, so the, the organic uh, circle and the inorganic uh, cycle of uh, materials use. And um, there's also a book called Cradle to Cradle by um, uh, an, an American architect and, and a German materials scientist that talks about cradle to cradle. So instead of materials going from cradle to grave, you dig them up, use them, and then put them back in a hole in the ground. You keep it in circulation and you, you reuse it and reprocess it. And if it's organic materials, um, then that's materials that can grow. You might eat it or use it for clothing or building. And when it's reached the end of its life, it can be composted and go back to the ground. Um, and if it's inorganic, then um, the chances are that you can't go back to the ground. So you really need to look after it. So if it's an iron, you mine it out from the ground, you process it very highly. And then um, the most important thing is to try and keep the quality high and keep it in circulation. Um, and mining is, of course, quite a destructive process, so uh, you really want to try and avoid doing that if you possibly can. But um, I put a link on the presentation there, which I think will be circulated later. And it's uh, lots of interesting documents there about um, how to retain the value in materials. Um, and as I say, this is, this is uh, just a, a reminder of what um, primary minerals extraction is really about. Um, and it can be devastating to the environment, often quite polluting and dangerous. And um, if you can retain materials in their highly processed form through, you know, old mobile phone or electronics or white goods, fridges or washing machines or such, or cars or any all those sorts of materials, then you can prevent um, the need for additional mining. Um, and I actually think that's really quite important environmentally and for carbon emissions. Um, and the other thing that's really in... Um, 
the the air certainly uh, in, in the UK is um, plastics use, and uh, a lot of people got quite obsessed obsessed with you know trying to reduce the amount of plastic they use. Um, and I think some inroads have been made, and there's certain kinds of plastics. That picture on the left is of um, polystyrene, which is very difficult to reprocess. Um, and there's just a lot of plastic in our life, and a lot of it's single-use plastic. And the reason is that um, people eat out a lot um, and pick up. Uh, takeaways and uh, coffee shops and what have you and uh, it just generates a lot of litter and a lot of single-use plastic and there's a lot of different ways you can approach that and um, and reduce the amount you use one is not, not to eat out on the go which of course has reduced uh, because of the covid pandemic but also this business with banned straws in the uk now and stirrers and you know un unnecessary pieces of plastic which are just are for, for decoration but often become litter and become the problem of somebody like Darren who then needs to uh, sweep it up off the street. So uh, a lot of it's about pre prevention and thinking about um, the, the way in which you, you have your, your run your life. Perhaps you can take a, a Tupperware pot to, to work and bring your own lunch and that reduces all the waste um, involved in buying takeaway or sandwiches in a packet or something like that. And one of the, um, the success stories, I think, of the UK um, is that we're actually very good at collecting waste and the first thing you need to do is capture the stuff so this is a slightly unglamorous aspect of um, making sure there are sufficient bins available for households and businesses and people who are out and about and making sure that there are the right kinds of uh, collection facilities and frankly in um, all our big cities we have uh, an army of people with brooms and carts and street sweepers we spend a lot of their time just collecting the rubbish and the first really important aspect is make sure that there is comprehensive waste collection um, because if you're not collecting it, people are just sort of finding their own uh, routes to get rid of their waste then it will find its way into um, fields rivers you know the open land or they'll burn it in their own backyards um, and that's obviously very polluting so just a little bit of emphasis on this kind of unglamorous, important side of making sure that there's a comprehensive collection and that people need to get rid of stuff. Um, you've got you've put in place the, you know, an easy mechanism to do that. And um, Katja and I have got a list of companies that are, you know, are world leaders in terms of you know, bins, balers, um, vehicles and all that sort of stuff. It's really important. Um, well, policy for waste management is quite a complex sort of business, and um, I think it, it's it's in the nature of the the organisation really that it, that it will always be complex. Uh, in the UK, it's been driven by European policy traditionally, and um, all our policies come down from um, a lot of the, the European directives. And then the responsibility for waste management policy is split between several different departments. Um, the main uh, environmental protection department is called DEFRA, the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, but there's also a strong influence from uh, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy because they set the policy and the incentives for renewable energy. Um, and then uh, we have Planning Ministry, which is currently called the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. And they um, not only look after the planning system, which determines where waste management facilities can be located, um, but they're also responsible for um, the funding and steering of local government and all those municipalities are really where the action happens in terms of waste collection and disposal for households. And so they're quite closely involved in um, the processes. And then there's a the Department for International Trade uh, where Katja and I sit and uh, we, we really um, try and bind the whole thing together into a single story when we're talking to colleagues abroad. And then more locally you have... Um, the enforcement and regulators who um, I, I know um, colleagues are going to talk about this a little bit later but just to uh, emphasize really that if you have a set of rules for waste management they must be enforced people have to follow them and there's really no point in telling people that they can't discard their waste in the local river um, if there's no penalty for doing so and we have an organization called the environment agency which is a, uh, essentially a government funded body who um, have powers to uh, or prosecute people who don't manage their waste correctly and they issue a permit to people who uh, do manage waste and they check how it's done and they make sure the systems are rigorous and that uh, there's no polluting activity happening. Um, and local authorities also have uh, an environmental health role which is also about um, preventing pollution. 
And then in terms of the actual carrying out of waste management, again, local authorities and municipalities are key. They are responsible for collecting waste from households. And then um, the higher tier local authorities are responsible for disposing of that waste. Um, and those two functions, collection and disposal, obviously very closely connected, but not quite the same. <laughs> and they can pull in different directions, depending on how you collect it. Um, and then there are private companies who collect um, waste from businesses and um, run disposal operations. And then there's uh, what we call the third sector, which is charities or um, voluntary organizations and they're quite an important part of the whole system because they manage clothing and furniture and toys and books and uh, it's slightly unglamorous but again they um, are really important in dealing with uh, sort of harder to manage um, kinds of products and also they you know if they, if they do it correctly they can, they can make a bit of money for, for their causes um, and certainly I think um, during the lockdown there's been a lot of clearing out of houses and people have been throwing away a lot of things. The charity sector, the charity shops um, and thrift stores as they call them in America are really quite important. And then there's a sort of intermediate um, infrastructure which is uh, transfer stations, recycling centres, places where material is bulked and um, bales and that's really important because if you have um, a loose pile of aluminium cans or plastic bottles it's not worth anything to anyone if it's clean and bailed and can be handled then you can take it to a reprocessor and get good money for it um, and so that sort of transfer network of, of facilities is really important and any municipality or area really needs to make sure that it has a comprehensive uh, network of those sorts of facilities and then for waste that can't be reprocessed into new products, we have the residual waste that um, will be disposed of either to landfill or um, incineration. And that's responsible uh, responsibility of waste disposal authorities, which are the higher tier local authorities and the private sector who carry out a lot of that activity. And for organic material, that could be uh, composting or anaerobic digestion or um, some sort of sorting and processing. MBT stands for um, mechanical and biological treatment, which is a sort of a catch-all term for um, drying and shredding and treating waste so that you get as many um, of the reusable products out of it and then um, reduce the amount of residual waste produced. And then finally, um, you might send the res residue either to landfill or um, an incinerator of some sort, or um, indeed turn into a fuel and um, some of it is exported to uh, particularly Holland from the UK because uh, the waste transfer, the, the waste incinerators there are more efficient and use the heat more. And there's a, a lot of work going on in the UK to try and uh, capture the heat. This is just a, a picture of a, 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 a yard where <laughs> a transfer station, just to again emphasize the importance of that intermediate infrastructure where you sort and treat and, and look after waste and makes it much more efficient. Um, so this is a picture of a big anaerobic digestion facility, and that's really uh, a crucial technology for food waste and organic wastes. Um, it's quite a, a technical process and um, needs quite a lot of operational expertise. But um, if you take the food waste out of uh, mixed waste, then everything else is cleaner, lighter. Typically, 30 or 40 percent of household waste is organic, so it, you know, it, it cuts into a huge amount of the waste that's, that's produced. Um, and of course you get uh, methane from the process and that can either be injected back into the gas grid as often as in the UK or um, used locally to make electricity or power an industrial facility. And for off-grid locations, places that are off the gas network or far away from the electricity network, that's a really good power solution. Um, so for agricultural operations or food processing, anaerobic digestion is a really important um, part of the whole sort of waste uh, management supply chain and um, at the bottom is a is a picture of one of the uh, incinerators we have in uh, south of England very difficult to get permission um, sometimes depending on where the location is but in um, this this one is just on the edge of London and it's um, been designed to look <laughs> relatively beautiful and it takes a large amount of the waste from London um, very capital intensive approach um, but it, uh, it's driven in the, in the UK by, by a move away from landfill, which has become increasingly expensive um, through tax that's been put on landfill. So um, it's, it's an important part of the whole network. 
Um, and if you are going to use landfill, then they need to be properly engineered. And we still have a fair number of landfill sites in the UK. They have, uh, they're gradually reducing, but it's just important to acknowledge that they are there. They're important. It's not a great use of, of material, but if they are used, then you really need to engineer them properly. And of course, you can get landfill gas, you can get methane if it's um, piped up and, uh, and correctly engineered. So uh, there was a point when I think the UK's um, power supply had about 10% of its uh, supply was from landfill gas. So, um, you know, worth looking at. Uh, in the UK, um, waste management is, a, is managed uh, by the devolved administration. So Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales all have their own policy and England has uh, its, its waste policy for England. Um, and it is a local facility. So um, in a country like Russia, I think you, know, you have to give the responsibility for waste management right down to the cities and towns and regions because it's a sort of function that needs to be carried out on the ground. Um, the drivers are, um, I mean, it was quite interesting when, when the policy was devolved to uh, the different regions, the um, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales immediately picked it up as a, as, a, as a challenge. They wanted to try and prove themselves and produce some really um, advanced uh, sustainable policies. And they did very well in terms of producing some really imaginative um, forward thinking policies. And then delivering it's taken longer, but um, they've, they've again really improved their recycling rates over the years. Um, and it's worth looking at some of the um, the policy documents there and they all have their own um, permitting and enforcement and regulatory agencies to go with them and the money in the system just to say that um, the way that the UK uh, delivered the um, waste framework directive from Europe was to introduce a landfill tax so if you put biodegradable waste into a landfill site you have to pay a tax which started off as um, two pounds a ton when it was first introduced and was gradually introduced to the extent that it's now, I think, £94, 15 pence per ton, which is a lot of money. And on top of that, you've got to get your waste to the landfill site. So you've got transport and then you've got a gate fee. So the landfill operator will charge you something um, in order to cover their running costs. So to take a ton of waste to um, a landfill site uh, in the UK can easily cost £140, £150 um, or more. And so that means there's money in the system and that you, you, can look, you can use that money to find other options and build um, capital facilities in order to treat it. And that's really what's driven um, the development of residual waste management facilities in this country. And then um, it's also quite a political uh, issue. It's a very visible service. And um, I'm sure that Darren will talk a little bit about this, but uh, if people's bins aren't collected, they'll uh, let the council know and very, very quickly. It's a really important service for um, the, the elected councillors to, to deliver and make sure it's done properly. And they all like to um, make sure it's done the way that they determine. Um, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a matter of much local discussion. So it's something that the public sector really does have to get right um, as a household service. Um, this is uh, just to indicate how much waste there is in the, in the system and to say that uh, the way we measure waste at the moment is by weight, uh, which means that uh, a lot of the waste, waste, waste collected by weight is actually construction waste because it's heavy. Uh, it's not a terribly clever way of calculating it because really what you need to look at is what, what is the impact of the material? Is it hazardous? Is it dangerous to the environment? And what was the carbon input? So. Things like aluminium cans and uh, textiles have very, um, got a very high level of embedded carbon. And um, it's, it's worth putting a lot of resource into trying to recapture those uh, in environmental terms, whereas putting a lot of resource into capturing, uh, say, garden waste, grass clippings, very heavy, very wet, looks good on your weight figures, but not necessarily very carbon intensive. Um, and again, hazardous waste is probably worth putting a lot of effort into capturing those because of the damage that they could potentially cause to the environment. And data about um, what waste there is, how much there is, where it's going is, is really, really essential. Um, got a mixed picture in the UK. The data is collected by the Environment Agency when they issue permits for managing waste. Um, and all that data is publicly available on uh, the Environment Agency's website. But it needs a fair bit of analysis and understanding. And um, there's a big project currently underway to improve the data of how much waste is issued by who, what kind of material it is and where it's going. And that will really help, um, um, help us all understand what facilities are needed in order to manage the material more sustainably. 
Um, so this is a diagram from a um, report produced by the Mayor of London, who's done a lot of work on construction waste. Um, and there's a huge amount of scope to reduce the amount of waste um, produced in, in construction activity and demolition activity. If you plan a project very carefully and look at how much your materials you need and don't order too much and order the right kinds of materials cut to the right scale, then you can reduce the amount of waste on a, a, a construction project enormously. Um, and again, if the material is separated on site and put in lots of different skips by material, then you can take it away and, and have it recycled. If it's all mixed together, then it's a huge effort to, to sort it out again. Um, and so again, if, you, if you're interested, there's a really good report on the Mayor of London's website that looks at how to, to plan a construction project and a demolition project to reduce the amount of waste. And in big cities, this is really quite important because you want to try and reduce the amount of vehicle movements and the, the amount of waste coming in and out of the, of the city. So I've talked a little bit about data, and this is a, a bit of a hobby horse of mine, but just, um, just to say if you don't know what material you're dealing with, it's very difficult to deal with it in the best way. So um, the, this tool, the Waste Data Interrogator, is something that the Environment Agency produce, and as I say, it's publicly available, and you can um, stare at it for hours to work out how much waste comes out of each city and where it's going. Um, and there's some work going on to look at carbon-based reporting instead of weight-based reporting so that we can focus on the materials that, that really matter. Um, all this data is collected from the environmental permit. So if you handle waste, you must get a permit from the environment agency. And on that permit, you will give information, your waste transfer note will give information about what you're um, handling and where it's going. And then there are planning rules, so it's land use um, planning, which is really about uh, looking at the environmental impacts of uh, waste management activities and traffic and what have you. So it's very highly controlled um, business. And another source of information that we have is an organisation called RAP, which stands for the uh, Waste Resources Action Programme, which was initially set up by the government, is now um, operating as a, as a charitable consultancy. And they collect a lot of research and commission a lot of research. Um, and one of those reports shows how much uh, the gate fee is for different kinds of facilities in the UK. So just to give you a, a broad idea, this is a survey that they commission every year. Um, if you take a ton of waste to a materials recycling facility, MRF, um, you know, the, these are the sorts of uh, from 25, say, to 35 pounds a ton. This is just a, a broad idea of um, roughly how much you might be expected to pay. If you take it to a composting facility or an AD facility, it's between sort of 30 and 50 pounds a ton. And if you take it to an incinerator, um, the median cost is about 90 pounds a ton. And so you can see how much um, money is at stake there. And then um, just a, a final slide, really, on where we're headed with our future um, approach to waste management. The data is really important, as I've mentioned. We're trying to get higher recycling rates, and counting those recycling rates is obviously difficult. Um, we're heading for a, we're aiming for a 65% target. The UK recycles about 50%, just under 50% of its household waste at the moment, and that additional 15% is going to be really challenging to make. Um, and will require probably quite a different approach in a lot of ways, a lot um, more focus on food waste collection and some of the difficult to reach materials and a lot of communication. I think that's going to be one of the, um, the secrets to achieving this sort of target. So all households will need to participate and those households that aren't so keen will need to be sat down <laughs> to have a chat on a one to one basis just to talk through um, why it is that, you know, materials need to be separated and where they need to go and please can you not contaminate your recycling and you know do you have to produce so much of this sort of waste and it's a, it's, it's about um household behavior and it's it, i think this it, it's quite a challenge we'll see see if we make it in the next few years um and for residual treatment i mean these figures are uh, from one of our uh, companies operating in the uk there's an estimate that we need you know a lot more new anaerobic digestion facilities, you know, half a billion pounds worth of, of new AD, um, a billion pounds worth of new sorting facilities, and um, a lot more EFW for energy from waste or um, additional residual waste. Now, these 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 are these are high figures. I mean, they probably won't be delivered in the in the short term, but maybe you know, once we have a the ideal um, waste management facility this, this is the capacity we'll have and the um the real trick will be to design products so that they don't become waste in the first place 
And then there's a lot of work also going on in the UK to um, reuse materials into chemicals and fuels, aviation fuels or shipping fuels, uh, rather than just using them for electricity. So that was a quick canter through uh, waste management in the UK, and I'll now pass on to, to colleagues to take you to the next stage. Darren. Delara, sorry. Uh, and there is uh, one question uh, from the audience regarding your uh, presentation. You have mentioned uh, uh, the costs of 140-150 GBP per tonne. What does it include? Recycling, storage, or what? Well, that, that's for landfill. So that would include, most, most the bulk of it is the landfill tax. So it's a tax you have to pay to the government for sending biodegradable waste to landfill. And it's been um, driven up in order to prevent people doing this. <laughs> so it, well, the, the signal the government is sending is, please find another route for your biodegradable waste. But if you are going to send a mixed bag of biodegradable waste to a landfill site, you have to pay £94 worth of tax um, and then a bit of transport, <coughs> depending on you know, how far it is and, and what your system is. But you'll collect it in a, in a dust cart, in a refuse collection vehicle. Maybe you'll take it to a, a, a bulking station. And then another vehicle will take it to the landfill site, or maybe it'll go straight to the landfill site. So that might be thirty pounds, forty pounds, I don't know, depending. And then there's a, a gate fee, so the, the tipping fee for the site. And the, the site operator obviously needs to be paid for buying the site and managing it and the staff and packing it properly and then um, you know, just keeping it within the regulations. So uh, the bulk of it is tax. Uh, I'm here. We will leave for a Q&A session. I will uh, note it and uh, we'll return to it. So uh, now screen is yours. Thank you. Okay, morning everybody. Can you hear me? Never know with this technology. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, I'm Darren. I look after the waste management for Birmingham City Council. Um, we're a large authority in the centre of the centre of the UK, roughly about 103 square miles, um, just over a po population of 1.1 million. Um, but they, they quite, our residents are quite densely populated, so we've got around 11,000 people per square mile. Um, it's been a city since 1889. Uh, but it's got a very much based in the industrial revolution. So it's got some very uh, individual challenges as a city for collection. And I'm going to talk you through how we collect and some of the issues that we have. Um, uh, an assistant director. Is that, is that my question? Anyway, so, so that's where, that's, that's what Birmingham is. Birmingham is split into it, basically three different types of roads. And the first, the first road really is is we've got some large uh, detached houses with uh with quite good gardens on the front and at the back plenty of places to storage uh weedy bins and various other receptacles um uh, normally has a, a a pavement at the front of it and then you a wide um collection route uh, road outside We've also got roads then that are semi-detached. So we've got uh, two houses together. Again, decent uh, front gardens to allow uh, storage of weedy bins. Um, slightly narrower, narrower roads, but, but um, still easy to, very easy to collect. And then we've got quite a number of roads where we have terraced houses, single dwellings, um, very little uh, storage on the front, very narrow roads, no, no off-road parking, and can cause some considerable issues relating to collections. We've also got in the city just over 213 high-rise uh, tower blocks um, that, that we also collect from, uh, but they're on communal bins. So just to give you some uh, rough ideas of, uh, of our data, so this is these are we've got we're based in four different depots across the city. These are Lifford, Montague Street, Perry Bar, Red and Redfern, and we collect in our recycling from on a fortnightly basis from 55,000 properties at Lifford and residual 
um, 108,000 properties, and that's on a weekly basis. And that's the number of roads that we we collect through on a weekly basis. So it's quite it's quite uh, just over half a million collections a week. Um, and then we've got garden on top of that and residuals uh, residual from communal areas on top of that as well. So it's quite a quite a large operation within the within the city. Just to give you a breakdown of, of what we collect and how we collect at the moment. Um, we have residual waste in 180 litre bins um, and that's collected on weekly and it, it, anything could go into that bin. We also then have fortnightly collections where you, we collect paper, plastic, glass and uh, cardboard um, and tins. Um, we have a separate pod which sits in the container to keep the paper separate to try and maintain the quality of paper collection. And we, through the summer periods, well, from February to October, we have a, a separate garden collection, which is paid for. So the residents buy, buy into that service, whereas the other two services are, are centrally funded. Um, some of the properties, as we've seen on some of them, we can't have a bin. And where you can't have a bin, then, we, then sacks are provided and, and containers. But the collection is exactly the same. So it's still a weekly collection for sacks um, and fortnightly collection for recycling. So our process from a house, uh, we have various different options. We go from the wheelie bins for, for a garden, for example. The garden goes uh, collected through a separate uh, vehicle to the waste transfer station and then in Birmingham's case goes to open windrows to compost down and we compost around 34,000 tonnes of garden waste each year. For residual waste, that's on a weekly basis, that is collected again with the same uh, it's a, a, a separate uh, refuse truck, it goes to a transfer station and in this case once it's, once it's been sorted and checked over, it goes off to an energy for waste plant where we incinerate and produce electricity from, from that waste. Our recycling is collected on a uh, fortnightly basis and again in a separate vehicle. That then goes to the waste transfer station and the waste transfer station then sorts that. Our paper goes to a separate recycling market and the rest of it goes to a material recovery facility where we do additional sorting and then various elements of that are sorted back and goes through to recycling. At the moment uh, we still get quite a high a degree of contamination from households putting things in the wrong bin and around 13% of our waste that goes into this facility ends up back at our incinerator producing electricity. So our crew our crews collect on a on a weekly or fortnightly basis in, in designated vehicles. We we have fairly small runs because we're compact in the in the city because they're, but they're on average they're picking uh, each vehicle goes through to around about 1,500 properties a day. Um, the crews are made of a driver that is responsible for the vehicle, a loader who, who, who puts the bins onto the back. But we've also in introduced over the last two years a new role on the back where they load, but they also record data. And they're recording data because data is key to, to the whole of this issue. And we are now being able to identify with through a handheld PDA system, individual households which regularly contaminate or streets. Whereas before we was getting quite bulky information, we now know individual areas where we can concentrate and send our waste prevention teams to the site. So, we each of our vehicles have tracking facilities and uh, the the 
technology that we use um, maps the round and and then we are able to overlay the round that the computer has generated to say it's um, um, the most effective way of collecting with the route from the vehicle so we can overlay that and check that the teams have collected what they've said they've collected and also the technology on the vehicle also allows us to identify where they're lifting bins or whether they're just driving past as well so we can we can monitor the performance because as deborah says it is it is one of the most politically um sensitive areas of of, of local authorities where it doesn't take too much for people to um complain and um when they don't get the, the right service and quite rightly so but we we have been through a number of changes over the last 18 months within birmingham which has led us to go on to sh in, in strike in some places and stop collecting and during those times we was getting over 2,000 calls a day from residents asking when their um, bins are collecting compared to now when we are we're, when we're on normal collections around 30 or 40. Uh, you've seen you've seen this slide before uh, the this is our, our waste hierarchy it, it's really important for us to understand the, um, the the waste that we're collecting and and our aim is to try and reduce that waste so at the moment the city uh, the average residence in the city household produces around 550 tons of waste a year that is too much and we're working to try to reduce that with with residents because we need to we need to get that down and understand what that is um, we've just we've got one reuse center but we're working significantly with the charities to to where people are booking bulky waste collections or situations where they want to get rid of large items of waste such as a wardrobe which might be perfectly usable we're now starting to uh, ask or transfer those inquiries to some charities or reuse sites that we've set up in our uh, recycling centers so if it's too good to throw away but you don't want it anymore there's a there's an abil ability now to get that product whether it's a bed whether it's a, a wardrobe or a chest of drawers now back into the market to enable people to uh, to to take that through through various charity shops and we're, we're just looking at a scheme at the moment with our housing department when people are just going into um, housing, uh, council housing, that we are looking at a starter pack made up from recyclable um, uh, furniture that people have, 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 have perfect, it's perfectly w workable, but uh, people want to move on and, and, and various tellies, fridges, and um, we're trying to pull up a, a, a basic set together. So when you get your council house, you will also get a set of furniture if you need to our current recycling rate is is ridiculously low um, it's currently it was it was 70 70 percent um, across the city we are currently at 26 percent but if you add in the bottom ash from our incinerator that takes us up to 40 percent but it is a significant pressure that we have to try and increase that through getting out getting through to the residents that they it, the recycling starts at the home not at the sorting point and the, the, we, we are the work that we're doing with the crews now identifying individual roads and individual areas is enabling us to target that that work uh, which we will hopefully see an increase in our recycling rate but because we're still on weekly collections that's one of the downsides of of um of our of our current collection process it, it, people can just easily throw rubbish away and we want to make it a bit more difficult to make people more recycle more thought it'd be i thought it was interesting to look at data because data is key um and look at the difference what has happened over lockdown and covid uh from this year compared to to last year and actually what you can see is that we've had some significant uh, reductions because we closed our recycling centers because it was an essential trip um, we also 
lost a lot of trade because a lot of the shops were shut, which was down, which, which is understandable. And the charity, our, our use of the charities is also down by 55%. But what, was that, what has actually happened, although we've had an increase as people have cleared their houses uh, through boredom, I suppose, um, in our household collected waste, our recycling has also is up 23% on this time last year. So because people are at home a bit more, they have been able to segregate and sort their waste out slightly better. And we have seen a, a, a more of an increase in our uh, recycling which is which is a positive and we'll hopefully try and carry that going forward but talking about disposal this is a this is a this is a the, the level of waste that we collect on a yearly basis this is um this is about 20 percent of the city council's waste is collected through municipal waste um and we we collect just under the 500,000 tons the majority of that is uh, residual waste and this is where our recycling is and paper we're roughly around 18,000 tons and garden is 17,000 collection but also uh, another 16,000 where people take it directly to the HRC centers so it's important to understand your waste and your makeup so we, once you understand what it what it is you can then start to look for, for different options and and different routes forward we're very lucky in birmingham we've got a paper mill um so we we segregate our waste uh to keep our paper try try to keep it as clean as possible and we we have a separate contract with the paper mill in birmingham where eighteen thousand tons of that goes directly back through to that paper mill um so looking at the feed stock because we do an, an analysis of our feedstock like that every every month, and 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 as Deborah said, the, the majority of our waste that we are currently burning is organic, and it's around that 36%, exactly exactly what is seems to be national average. Um, and at the moment in Birmingham, we don't collect food waste, but we are looking at starting to collect food waste, um, which will increase our collection costs but we'll take 36% out of current uh, incineration and move it into our recycling rates, which will, which will make a difference. Um, very low um, percentages wise of, of, of some of the plastics uh, that we, we haven't been able to um, recycle, but um, it's important. We, we carry out this test every month so we can understand what the food stock is. It does change a little bit, it's frustrating to find that some of the some of the paper still gets through, some of the cardboard still gets through to incineration, and he's not being able to take it out because it's been mixed so um, so badly within in the um, in the in the collection rate. Um, so so we we what we're trying to do going forward is that we've got a, a number of different rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. So we've got our teams that are pulling the information together and collecting that information on a daily basis of those roads that are doing well and those that are doing, doing not very well. Um, and we have got quite a mix. So in some, some of the uh, wards that we've got across the council, um, some of them are, are recycling over 50% of their waste. Um, some areas are down as less than 10 percent so we so we have a dedicated waste prevention team that are now working in those areas and those roads that we know are particularly bad to try and understand why they don't recycle and what we can do to make that easier for them to start to recycle um, one thing that we've really started to do and it, this is this is working with local groups to actually start to get them more in, involved in the environment as a whole and collect and recycle. So now when we do community litter picks, we don't just put all the waste as we did into one bag. The bags are segregated, cans, paper, cards is, is now being collected separately. And, and by working with groups and schools and doing this amount of work, that's starting, we're hoping to see that an effect happen in, in the household as they go for forward. If all that fails, 
we have uh, a waste enforcement team that will go around and they will do spot fines and they will do um, criminal prosecutions of people that are um, uh, abusing the system and and illegally disposing their waste on the streets and and making the city look uh, worse than than it, it needs to do. So looking at looking at that, this is this is our fly tipping um, stats, <clears throat> and this is this is regular uh, large amounts of dumping of waste. Um, where uh, some people will class that as um, residential waste, but it is what we have been seeing through uh, CCTV cameras that we've been put up, uh, traders and various other people putting it in bags and then dumping it on the streets. Now, what's, what, what is interesting that this year we've been on a fairly um, static movement over, the, over 2019, but since lockdown we've had a significant rise in the amount of fly tip that has, that has happily been presented and been reported um, to, to, the, um, to the city. And it's almost doubled. The numbers of incidents reported on a weekly basis have almost doubled over the, over the start of the year. Um, and this is an area that we, we, we are really looking to, um, to, to crack down and move on. Um, it is it is illegal and we have had some uh, very high profile cases where we've been able to um, seize vehicles crush vehicles of offenders some people have been convicted and gone into court but these are some of the stats that we've been that, that we've been uh, looking at over the last uh, last 12 months where we got over 672 investigations into commercial waste disposal offences, with traders just dumping waste on the street, um, and it goes it goes from that right down to um, individual uh, penalty point uh, penalty notices and and fines for people fighting in, in individual places. So we've got a number of a number of situations and a number of um, levels that we can go through to. To carry out the enforcement, but what we are what we what we're really concentrating on now is trying to work with all of the residents for them to understand what the what the implications of not recycling are, and make it as easy as possible for them to be able to recycle, and then that would leave waste enforcement as the last resource as it should be. Um, we have we have started to see an increase in our recycling. Um, through that process by, by providing that uh, more targeted response um, and we hope that over the next uh, few months and of continued action that we will be able to see that go uh, increasing over the next few months as well. So that's a, that's a whistle top tour of how we manage waste within one city in Birmingham. Um, just on our collections, it's around 500,000 tonnes a, a year that we deal with, but if, uh, that's around 20% of the, the overall waste of the city produces. Um, and uh, although it's a very simple service, it's a service that creates a lot of noise and a lot of pressure and is one that we are looking to increase and to improve over the, over the next few years with different types of collection methods and and increasing our recycling options so that that's that's it from me thank you for listening Darren, uh, we have several questions but i think that again we will uh, leave them for q a session uh so uh kenny oh, screen is yours thank you Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name's Kenny Hull. I'm the technical sales manager here at Carverco Recycling Plant. Uh, we're a company based in Northern Ireland and we specialize in plants for sorting and separation of waste. 
So I'll give you a bit of background about Kyverco. So we were established in 1993. Um, we have approximately 300 different installations across the world. Um, our core market has obviously been the UK and sort of primarily within that construction and demolition waste. Um, and at, at the minute, our plants process approximately 20 million tonnes of waste in the UK alone. Um, so with our, our equipment being designed sort of primarily for construction and demolition waste, a very high quality, high performance equipment. Um, and we're, we're very much focused on customer support. So we not only support our customers through the design, installation, commissioning of the plant, but also through the, the lifetime of the plant. We have global reach, as I say, we have about 80% of our businesses within the UK, but we also have a lot of installations across Europe um, in the Middle East and also as far away as Australia. So in terms of our, our offering, there's kind of two main sort of streams of, of, of solutions that we offer, one being our modular sort of semi-mobile equipment. Um, so these are kind of standalone pieces of equipment that can be used either on their own or together in a kind of a combination um, with a number of different machines. We have trommel screens, uh, air separators and picking lines. Um, so they're completely self-contained units with their own uh, generator, power supply and so on. Ideal for sort of short contract work, rental, etc., etc. Uh, quick setup time, um, very little infrastructure required to get these machines up and running. You can have a small waste plant up and running within one day. But that's kind of one part. The, the main part and the biggest portion of our business is still, you know, stationary or static, as we call them, uh, waste plants. So these are sort of bespoke, customized uh, processing lines for each customer to kind of meet their, their requirements. So in terms of our approach, uh, so we see ourselves not to be, I mean, we are an engineering company and we do manufacture a lot of equipment in the house, but we see ourselves as a solution provider um, and it's very much a consultation approach that we take. Um, whilst we do manufacture a lot of equipment, we also integrate a lot of market leading components. So we offer a full turnkey solution. But within that, we will include specialist equipment from recognized, reputable market leaders. So we get access to the best available technology and also all their experience and expertise in, in the different applications. So when I talk about the, the sort of consultation approach, what that, that means is we like to understand the customer's business, you know, how their operations work currently what problems they have because they, they all have issues and things that they want to try and improve upon and kind of identify what those are and how they would like us to, to solve those and with that what are their future objectives so plans for growth extra capacity higher recovery etc um, and then obviously the, the most important thing from my point of view as a technical sales manager is gathering the sort of relevant application data so what I mean by application data is the material type and composition. So is it construction, demolition waste? Is it household waste? Um, annual capacity. So how much waste do they process now? How much do they want to process in the future? Again, I talked about you know plans for growth. Um, required outputs. So what materials do they actually want to recover and separate? Um, we need photos, obviously, and measurements of the site, the building, and obviously of the material. And a, a very important thing for us as well is um, from a technical sales point of view is, is a sort of a financial justification. So a return on investment. So in order for us to do that, we need to understand the, the drivers. And I think that, you know, Deborah, you, you alluded to this quite a bit in terms of, you know, the financial drivers. So what are their gate fees? So the pounds per tonne that they can charge for waste coming in. What are their disposal costs, landfill taxes? labor costs um, and ultimately what outlets have they got for recovered material and what sort of return can they get from that. So within our proposal we can offer, we can do material sampling and testing and um, analyze the customer's material and give it a proper material composition. 
we design a process, we design a layout, we can give return on investment projections, and we can give performance guarantees. So guaranteeing to the customer that they will, the plant will do what we say it will do, and it will continue to do that for the lifetime of the plant. So in terms of applications, um, I've already mentioned, you know, our sort of core background has always been in construction and demolition waste. Um, but we can also offer solutions for commercial waste, household waste, dry mixed uh, or source separated waste, organic waste and compost, um, and also incinerator bottom ash, so sort of byproduct from waste to energy. So I mentioned earlier that we integrate um, some key components. So these are just some examples of some of the companies that we, we work with. So they're all, you know, globally recognized brands with a, a global footprint um, and they have a lot of experience and expertise and a lot of them have you know sort of bespoke test facilities where we can do all our material analysis as a company we don't have any official ties with any of these suppliers so it gives us the ability to be flexible and always offer the customer the best technology for their application um, and it works very well for us so I'll go through an example now as a sort of, sort of a case study for a recent installation that we did in the UK and um, just to kind of show how we, we use this process. So the customer uh, is at Mick George Skipar and um, we installed a plant for them for 150,000 tons a year of a mixed input of construction and demolition and commercial waste. So a bit of background to uh, the customer. So uh, Mick George, family owned company um, very well established in particularly in their quarrying and aggregate industry and at the time that we were first approached by them they were experiencing rapid growth in their waste management business um, thanks in no small part to a number of acquisitions of, of smaller companies and at that point they already had you know established outlets for recovered materials so what was their problem Problem was that the current equipment and facilities that they had simply couldn't handle the, the, the volumes that they were receiving and that was increasing rapidly. Uh, the processes that you used were, were manual, they were very labor intensive. Um, labor, manual labor in waste sorting plants, it's a high cost, it's unreliable and it's inconsistent. So that as well as you know, low commodity prices. So, as we all know, prices for commodities such as plastics, card, paper, it fluctuates. It's very up and down. And um, so that was a factor for them. Um, and obviously, they had increased demand for some of the outlets, such as recycled aggregates and uh, recovered wood. So the consultation process. Then we understood from the customer they wanted a flexible system to handle you know, different waste streams with a fair bit of variation in the waste composition. As we all know, that, that changes a lot. The design had to be future-proof, uh, capacity for expansion, and they wanted us to look at minimizing the manual labor within the process and focus a bit more on automation. As I mentioned already, 150,000 tons per annum capacity. And the primary focus was secondary aggregates, wood and metal. So we see that a lot with construction and demolition waste now with the commodity prices as they are um, and with a quite healthy sort of waste energy market that their focus is on the, the, the weight. So it's the heavy inert material, wood, metals and the rest of the material, it's, it's more profitable for them to just make that into an RDF and send that to waste to energy. So first step then was the, the sort of process design. So we, we did some on-site sampling and analysis of their material and um, that was done by our own technical team. Um, we sent some samples of that material to our technology partners test facilities to do some separation trials. We also conducted a number of reference site visits uh, with the customer and um, to some sites in Europe, you know, to look at the sort of best available technology and get them comfortable with how it worked and what, what could actually be achieved. So, you know, we optimized the, the process 
with the, the, the items on the previous slide in terms of the design brief. So uh, as I mentioned earlier for this particular customer, this was a relatively new thing for them and they were very familiar with crushing and screening and aggregate and so on but waste processing they, they were only really in the very early stages of it so in order for us to sort of help them kind of make that decision to invest we had to do some sort of return on investment calculations so we look at the capital expenditure versus the operating expenditure and do a sort of a comparison of a sort of high capex, high automation system versus a low capex but high opex with a lot of manual labor and kind of justify that to them and um, that it's it's the right way to go. Obviously factoring into that running costs, maintenance costs, energy consumption that goes with that. So then once we've agreed on the, the sort of the process design and the financial justification, we then do the the layout design. So you can see there on the right is sort of an example of 3D render of the, the installation. So we, we work, there's a number of different factors, obviously our own expertise and experience in designing the system to optimize it for the sort of flow material and make it easy for the customer to maintain. Get input from the client on that as well. There's also obviously constraints in terms of the building that we have to fit it inside and obviously the customer's budget. Um, but always with a focus on you know optimizing the, the, the material will flow through the plant easily. So we, I have a video. I think Katya, if you could play the video of the the time lapse installation, just to show, just shows how we offer. As I said, we offer a complete turnkey solution, um, and it basically we do everything from the ground up. So the customer provides us with a building with a, a concrete slab, and we we take care of everything above that. Okay, and just to follow on from that then, so that gives you an idea of, of the installation. The, the next one then is another video, which just gives a bit of information about the customer. And it also is quite a, a nice animation within it, which explains the, the process of the, the plant. In today's world, organizations are more conscious of the operational impact they have on both the environment and the communities around them. At McGeorge, we understand this, and with over 35 years experience in waste management and recycling, we offer customers a fully verifiable 100% landfill diversion for their waste, helping them reduce costs, enhance their social and environmental profile, and comply with their current waste regulations. We chose to use McGeorge because they're a big part of the, the local community, and uh, they provide a good service for us at Serpentine Green. Meet George definitely understood our requirements as a football club. They really made it their business to understand exactly what we needed and have delivered on that. When we first met with Mick George to discuss our requirements for waste, they were able to offer a zero to landfill straight away because this was something they were already doing. All of our waste is now passing through there and all the recyclers are taken out as far as possible. Whatever is left then goes for waste from energy. So, they have met our expectations of a contract that we were hoping to have in by the end of the year at the very beginning. So we were really pleased with the way it's worked out for us. From segregation and collection to recycling and reporting, 
we take the hassle out of the waste management process. The success behind our landfill diversion process is our deep understanding of waste components and our ability to separate and sort the material for recycling and recovery at our dedicated recycling centre in Cambridgeshire, which enables us to pass on savings to our clients. Welcome to the Mick George Recycling Centre. Allow us to demonstrate how it works. To begin with, waste is loaded onto a conveyor belt and transported into the recycling plant. Next, a vibrating screen separates the larger waste material and conveys it through one of our picking stations, where operatives pick out any unsuitable material before it reaches the shredder. The larger material is then shredded down and combined with the smaller material from the previous waste screen. The waste is then conveyed beneath an inline electromagnet which removes any ferrous metals. At this point, the waste is then passed through a combi screen, which again uses vibrations to split the material according to size. Our density separator then removes heavy fraction material and sorts into light and mid fraction. An overband magnet is then used above the conveyor belt to once again pick out any remaining ferrous metals. The optical sorter then identifies and removes non-wood material. Before entering a final picking station, the waste is checked for any remaining contamination and non-wood items. Finally, operators manually sort waste according to component, recovering any material that is suitable for recycling, which is then passed to the baler. The material is then baled and transported for recycling. Any waste that can't be recovered from this process is used to produce a sustainable source of energy. At McGeorge, we pride ourselves on offering our customers both an environmentally friendly and cost-effective solution for managing their waste. We would recommend McGeorge because they go above and beyond what we need. The service we've received has been fantastic and I'll have no hesitation whatsoever in recommending other businesses get involved with McGeorge. Well, I've been very impressed with the way McGeorge will handle the contract. For an environmentally friendly landfill diversion, call 0800 587 3329 or visit our website, mickgeorge.co.uk. So, uh, as I said earlier, you know, our support goes beyond just the supply and installation of the equipment, um, and, and we look after our customers. So, once we've installed the plant, there was an extensive sort of commissioning and handover phase where we optimised the plant performance, train up the, the customer in the operation and maintenance of the plant, and um, pleased to say that the, the plant exceeded the customer's expectations and continues to and you know as part of a continuous learning we also identify areas for potential improvement in performance and efficiencies for future projects and also for potential upgrades for this particular customer for their plant so I have a few examples um, of the sort of solutions that we can offer. As I said, obviously every one is sort of customized and bespoke for the customer, but these are kind of generic examples. A typical sort of C&D waste processing plant where you have feeding, screening, manual sorting, uh, metal recovery, and some air separation. Um, and then we get into sort of more more automated processes, so whenever the tonnages increase and the customer wants to use less manual labour, then we add things such as sort of pre-shredding, more air separation, optical sorting, more equipment to sort of mechanically sort the material and allow them to handle more volume but use less people. Um, as I said, we offer for lots of different applications. This is an installation we actually have recently installed in Dubai uh, for the Dulsco, and it's to process dry mixed recyclable material. Um, 
again, it, it's a kind of a halfway house between manual sorting and mechanical sorting. Labor is obviously very affordable out there for those guys, so they can they can they wanted to kind of keep that balance. And um, this is another example of a, a design for the treatment of incinerator bottom ash. Um, it's usually very rich in metals, ferrous and non-ferrous metals. So the focus there is it's purely just on screening magnets for separating ferrous metals and eddy current separators for extracting all the, the non-ferrous metals from it. And this is another example. Um, Deborah mentioned earlier about mechanical MBT, mechanical biological treatments. This is an example of that for household waste where we shred the material, screen it. The finer material which contains the organic and moisture goes to a, a biological process to be dried. So you take that moisture away and then we reintroduce that material back into the system and we get a, a stabilized material um, which can be used for landfill cover and then with the rest of the material we can produce an RDF or an SRF for, for waste to energy. So some examples of customers that we've worked for. Um, Veolia, we've done some work with them in the UK on their organics plants. Ramondas, we installed their first construction and demolition waste plant in the UK, up in the, the northeast. Mick George, we've seen in the, the presentation. Biffa, Renewi, Averda, and we're actually in the process of manufacturing a plant for them for CMD waste for Saudi Arabia. And Dulsco, we've just done the recent installation in Dubai, in the UAE. And that is the end of my brief presentation. Thank you everybody for listening and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Kenny. Uh, yeah, we have uh, several questions. I think that uh, I will start from the very beginning. Uh, to Deborah, do you have any governmental support for uh, recycling plants? Um, they used to be, there is a sort of recycling credit system. The, the system for funding recycling waste management is really quite complex. So for household waste, um, the uh, money that local authorities get is um, partly from households and partly from central government, and it's quite a complex uh, formula. And the amount of waste, the money that, that's spent on waste <coughs> um, is sort of hidden amongst other duties of the local council, um, which is education and social services and building roads and planning and you know, all sorts of public services. So most people aren't aware of how much of their um, household tax goes to, to waste management. So it's sort of in there but the, the real uh, money as i say is in um in the landfill tax so it's in the in, in the sort of system in terms mm. of disposing of it and that costs local authority a lot of money and businesses a lot of money so it's sort of the the, the future of um funding all this is in what we call epr the, the extended producer responsibility and the idea uh, is in the um english policy that was published a couple of years ago which is really about taxing products which are difficult to process. So if you put a product on the market that is um, a compound product, like um, a Tetra Pak or a Pringles tube or some, something with paper, card, metals, two different kinds of plastics, it's really quite difficult to recycle. Technically it can be recycled, but economically it's not really worth it. The, the, um, the plan is to, to put a tax on that sort of product so that the um, waste management system can afford to, to take it apart and process it. and the idea being that the, um, the the food production companies or whoever's putting making those products will redesign their products to make them easier to recycle and reprocess. Um, but at the moment, the public sector is, is carrying the, the bulk of the, the cost of waste management. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, was actually during uh, Darren's presentation, but I think that uh, you can also decide uh, who is. Uh, who would answer this. Uh, what is the price of all uh, payments for an individual for waste management? All payments uh, in total for individual. <laughs> uh, well, well, actually, it's, it's collected through tax. So the only cost to people in Birmingham uh, extra to what they co collect uh, what we collect through our council tax process is for garden waste and we charge um, 
50, well, for, between 40 and 50 pound a year for an additional garden charge. All the others, all the other cost is kept, kept within the, the taxation process that we, we get paid through local government. Yeah, thank you. And what is uh, the proportion, in what ratio separate garbage collection is performed in relation to all other types? Sorry, the, the relationship between separate collection and residual collection. Uh, uh, what, yeah, what, what is uh, the ratio of uh, separate uh, collection in relation to general other types of collection? Just, just to say, for, for households, um, it yep. depends on the, the, how the council is collecting it. So, um, Darren's explained the system in Birmingham. From, for where I live in a rural part of, of England, um, I have a fortnightly collection of recyclable a green bin with um, paper card and cans and things, and then a fortnightly collection of residual waste. And um, actually, the amount of recycling is slightly more than residual waste because I'm a waste person and I spend a lot of time separating out my waste and trying to um, not throw away residual waste. So, the recycling rate is, is typically um, sort of 40, 40 something percent. It depends. Urban areas, it's much harder uh, for various reasons. Rural areas tend to have higher recycling rates. Um, and then for businesses, um, the data is weak, but it's it's a little bit higher. Recycling is, tends to be, um, say, 45 or 60 percent, between 40 and 60 percent, depending on the kind of business. And for industrial waste, it can be higher still. So if a business is producing only a handful of co-products or outputs, then they can um, often find a market for it or, or recycle it more easily. But it's, it's entirely within your control, and it's um, the government's objective is really to try and sort of use the taxation system and incentive to, to try and steer companies to reduce the amount of mixed residual waste they produce and, and separate it out so that it's all reprocessed yeah yeah there's no st there's no standard across the uk um so mm. you can you can have surrounding authorities all collecting differently on different frequencies and and asking for residents to separate uh, different types of waste out. So that that is one of the issues that that is being looked at at the moment. Thank you. And we have a question from David Gardner. Uh, Russia has a domestic waste volume of 70 plus million tons of household waste per year, which is for 55 million Russian households is equivalent to three, three and a half kilos per household uh, per day. Do we have similar figures for the UK? We, we do have all those figures. And in fact, just uh, using my calculator, it's roughly similar. So about, we, we, say, we, we say about a year worth of rubbish is about a ton per household. And it's a little bit less on average and in some depending on the size of the household and, and the, the sort of data that uh, Darren is collecting will be much more refined so he'll have information per street or per ward you know per little area of his uh, authority and be able to work out that um, some households in fact um, some authorities know a lot more about what's going on in a household than, than, than anyone else because they know if a lot of rubbish is coming out of a household it's probably got a lot of people in it but some yeah. people might have like you know ten or eight people in there um, whereas that you know nobody else is aware of that, but they know how much rubbish is produced from, from that household. So there's a lot of data you can, uh, yeah. a lot of information you can find out from the waste data if you collect it and analyse it properly. No, sorry. Yeah, that's 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 right. We've got we we don't we don't um, weigh individual bins, but we do weigh per round. So we we know the uh, the average of the street, and we know how that changes over the year. We also know that we've got one resident in Birmingham that only puts one bag out a year of, of residual waste, uh, but that is very unique. Um, but it, and it's great pleasure to deliver that bag to us. Um, um, and, and you know, it, it's 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 it, you go from that to somebody having a 360 litre bin uh, collected every week full of rubbish. It depends on the households. It depends on them. Um, uh, on on what people are doing with their recyclers, yeah, and oh. their lifestyle, and it's it's and that's why all the communication that, that that Darren was talking about is so important. And the part part of the the initiative that the government's looking at is actually how to do a national 
communication campaign, standardise the system for all local authorities so they collect the same sorts of materials in the same, roughly in the same way. Yeah. And really do some strong public relations and community work so that everybody understands that um, buying certain goods in a certain kind of way will result in a lot of refuse and you can control that and change it. And there's a big campaign called um, Love Food, Hate Waste, which is about food waste reduction. And a lot of that is just about how you shop and how you store your food and keeping your fridge at the right temperature and not and how to use your leftovers. There's a lot of different small actions which need to be taken in order to tackle the issue. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how much of uh, the UK waste is exported and where is it going now that China has banned imports of waste? So uh, China is, uh, yes, not taking its waste from um, all over Europe and Australia and America. They, um, so this is different kinds of waste. So, so the, way, the material we were sending to China was uh, recycling. So it was, tends to be plastic and paper mainly. Uh, now that's going to Indonesia, Turkey, Cambodia. Um, and we are working quite hard to try and process it within the UK. Um, there's also, as I mentioned, some of the, the residual um, waste, which has turned into refuse-derived fuel. Um, and some of that has been exported historically to Europe. Uh, it was 2.6 million tonnes last year in 2019. And again, um, that's reducing for a whole range of reasons. One of which is that we're gradually building more infrastructure in the UK to manage that waste. So really that's my job, is to, is to look at the investment that we need in the UK in terms of uh, residual waste treatment and recycling infrastructure and to try and work on the economics to make it worth doing uh, in the UK. In, 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 in Birmingham, we, we don't export any, so all, all of our waste is processed within the UK and the recyclers, um, but a uh, majority of that is through the energy for waste, so it is turned into electricity through incineration. Thank you very much. And uh, next question is for Kenny. Uh, the video shows the installation process of the line. Uh, no water ventilation, fire safety solutions, trays for collection liquid spills on the floor. Uh, it, is it uh, not required in the UK? It is, but it varies from installation to installation. So, I mean, we can obviously offer all those things, you know, as part of our solution, um, but Things like fire suppression and dust control. We do have dust control within the system. Water isn't really, we don't, we don't, it's all dry processing that we do. Fire suppression is a big thing, but generally what we find with any of our customers, we don't have the opportunity to specify the fire suppression. It's the customer's insurance company that will specify it. Now we can supply it, you know, as part of the full solution, but it's usually driven by insurance companies specify what what system has to be used. So usually we install the plant with whatever dust control measures that the customer requires um, and then the customer will take care of the, the fire suppression equipment. So yes it is, it, it's required in the UK and it is becoming more and more prevalent as we hear, you know, quite often you hear in the news about fires at, at waste sites in the UK. So it's, it's, it's a hot topic at the minute, excuse the pun. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, actually, we don't have uh, any active questions at the moment in chat session. Uh, in case if there is uh, no question, uh, you are really welcome to uh, write uh, all you would like to, to know more in email and we will forward it to our speakers. Uh, last call for the question. So if not, thank you very much, Deborah, uh, Darren, Kenny. Uh, thank you everyone so much for being with us today. Uh, please, if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, to, uh, to, feel, to drop us a line. We are always happy to help. I hope this uh, webinar was uh, useful and uh, there are some, some uh, ah, there is a question, uh, do you use uh, Fandomite. I'm actually not really sure what is a fandomite. Uh, do, do you know something like that? Fandomite? Doesn't ring any bells to me, no. I will try to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
machine. Oh, it's... Um... It's automatic container acceptance. No, we don't. No, I haven't heard of it. I think that you have. Do you uh, accept that? Oh, yeah, yes. It's, a, it's like a reverse bending machine. I don't think yeah. there, I know Scotland were talking about introducing something like that, but I don't think it has been implemented. Scotland and England are both committed to looking at um, introducing deposit return schemes and the reverse ending machines might be part of that, but that's still being looked at. Mm -hmm. It's under discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. As I've said, uh, feel free to drop us a line and have any other questions. Uh, Thank you, and uh, see you next time on our future events. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for organizing it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers, then. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Kenny. Uh, yeah, we have uh, several questions. I think that uh, I will start from the very beginning. Uh, and to Deborah, do you have any governmental support for uh, recycling plants? Um, there used to be, there is a sort of recycling credit system. The, the system for funding recycling waste management is quite, really quite complex. So for household waste, um, the uh, money that local authorities get is um, partly from households and partly from central government, and it's quite a complex uh, formula. And the amount of waste, the money that, that's spent on waste <coughs> Um, it's sort of hidden amongst other duties of the local council, uh, which is education and social services and building roads and planning and you know, all sorts of public services. So most people aren't aware of how much of their um, household tax goes to, to waste management. So it's sort of up in there. The, the, the real uh, money, as I say, is in, um, in the landfill tax. So it's in the, in, in the sort of system in terms mm. of disposing of it. And that costs local authority a lot of money and businesses a lot of money. So... It's sort of the, the, the future of um, funding all this is in what we call EPR, the, the Extended Producer Responsibility. And the idea uh, is in the um, English policy that was published a couple of years ago, which is really about taxing products which are difficult to process. So if you put a product on the market that is um, a compound product, like um, a Tetra Pak or a Pringles tube or some, something with paper, card, metals, two different kinds of plastics, it's really quite difficult to recycle. Technically, it can be recycled, but economically, it's not really worth it. The, the, um, the plan is to, to put a tax on that sort of product so that the um, waste management system can afford to, to take it apart and process it. And the idea being that the, um, the, the food production companies or whoever's putting, making those products will redesign their products to make them easier to recycle and reprocess. Um, but at the moment, the public sector is, is carrying the, the bulk of the, the cost of waste management. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, was actually during uh, Darren's presentation, but I think that uh, you can also decide uh, who is uh, who would answer this. Uh, what is the price of all uh, payments for an individual for waste management? All payments uh, in total for individual. <laughs> uh, well, well, actually, it's it's collected through tax. So the only costs to people in Birmingham uh, extra to what they co collect, uh, what we collect through our council tax process, is for garden waste, and we charge um, fifty. Well, for, between forty and fifty pound a year for an additional garden charge all the others all the other cost is kept kept within the the taxation process that we we get paid through local government yeah, thank you and what is uh, the proportion in what ratio of separate garbage collection is performed in relation to all other types so, sorry the, the relationship between separate collection and residual collection uh, 
what yeah what what is uh, the ratio of uh, separate uh, collection in relation to general other types of collection right just just to say for for households um it yep. depends on the, the how the council is collecting it so um Darren's explained the system in Birmingham from for where I live in a rural part of, of England um I have a fortnightly collection of recyclable a green bin with um, paper card and cans and things and then a fortnightly collection of residual waste and um, actually the amount of recycling is slightly more than residual waste because I'm a waste person and I spend a lot of time getting out my waste and trying to um, not throw away residual waste so the recycling rate is, is typically um, sort of 40, 40 something percent it depends urban areas it's much harder uh, for various reasons the rural areas tend to have higher recycling rates um, and then for businesses, um, the data is weak, but it's it's a little bit higher. Recycling is tends to be, um, say, 45 to 40 or 60 percent, between 40 and 60 percent, depending <laughs> on the kind of business. And for industrial waste, it can be higher still. So if a business is producing only a handful of co-products or outputs, then they can um, often find a market for it or, or recycle it more easily. But it's, it's entirely within your control, and it's um, the government's objective is really to try and sort of use the taxation system and incentive to, to try and steer companies to reduce the amount of mixed residual waste they produce and, and separate it out so that it's all reprocessed yeah yeah there's no st there's no standard across the uk um so you can you can have surrounding authorities all collecting differently on different frequencies and and set asking for residents to separate uh different types of waste out so that that is one of the issues that that is being looked at at the moment thank you and we have a question from david gardner uh russia has a domestic waste volume of 70 plus million tons of household waste per year which is for 55 million Russian households is equivalent to three, three and a half kilos per household uh, per day. Do we have similar figures for the UK? We, we do have all those figures. And in fact, just uh, using my calculator, it's roughly similar. So about, we, we, say, we, we say about a year worth of rubbish is about a ton per household. And it's a little bit less on average and in some depending on the size of the household and, and the, the sort of data that uh, Darren is collecting will be much more refined so he'll have information per street or per ward you know per little area of his uh, authority and be able to work out that um, some households in fact um, some authorities know a lot more about what's going on in a household than, than, than anyone else because they know if a lot of rubbish is coming out of a household it's probably got a lot of people in it but some yeah. people might have like you know 10 or 8 people in there um, whereas that you know nobody else is aware of that, but they know how much rubbish is produced from, from that household. So there's a lot of data you can, uh, yeah. a lot of information you can find out from the waste data if you collect it and analyse it properly. No, sorry. Yeah, that's 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 right. We've got we we don't we don't um, weigh individual bins, but we do weigh per round. So we we know the uh, the average of the street, and we know how that changes over the year. We also know that we've got one resident in Birmingham that only puts one bag out a year of, of residual waste, uh, but that is very unique. Um, but it, and it's great pleasure to deliver that bag to us. Um, um, and and it, you know, it, it's 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 it, you go from that to somebody having a 360 litre bin uh, collected every week full of rubbish. It, it depends on the household, it depends on them. Um, um, uh, on on what people are doing with their recyclers, yeah, and oh. their lifestyle, and it's it's and, and that's why the all communication that, that that Darren was talking about is so important. And the part part of the the initiative that the government's looking at is actually how to do a national communication campaign, standardise the system for all local authorities so they collect the same sorts of materials in the same roughly in the same way, yeah, and really do some strong public relations and community work so that everybody understands that. Um, buying certain goods in a certain kind of way will result in a lot of refuse and you can control that and change it. And there's a big campaign called um, Love Food, Hate Waste, which is about food waste reduction. And a lot of that is just about how you shop and how you store your food and keeping your fridge at the right temperature and, not, and how to use your leftovers. 
there's a lot of different small actions which need to be taken in order to tackle the issue. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how much of the UK waste is exported and where is it going now that China has banned imports of waste? So, uh, China is, uh, yes, not taking its waste from um, all over Europe and Australia and America. They, um, so this is different kinds of waste. So, so the waste, the material we were sending to China was uh, recycling. So it was tends to be plastic and paper mainly. Uh, now that's going to Indonesia, Turkey, Cambodia, um, and we are working quite hard to try and process it within the UK. Um, there's also, as I mentioned, some of the, the residual um, waste, which has turned into refuse-derived fuel, um, and some of that has been exported historically to Europe. Uh, it was 2.6 million tonnes last year in 2019, and again, um, that's reducing for a whole range of reasons, one of which is that we're gradually building more infrastructure in the UK to manage that waste. So really that's my job, is to, is to look at the investment that we need in the UK in terms of uh, residual waste treatment and recycling infrastructure and to try and work on the economics to make it worth doing uh, in the UK. In, 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 in Birmingham, we, we don't export any, so all, all of our waste is processed within the UK and the recyclers, um, but the uh, majority of that is through the energy for waste, so it is turned into electricity through incineration. Thank you very much. And uh, next question is for Kenny. Uh, the video shows the installation process of the line. Uh, no water ventilation, fire safety solutions, trays for collection liquid spills on the floor. Uh, it, is it uh, not required in the UK? It is, but it varies from installation to installation. So, I mean, we can obviously offer all those things, you know, as part of our solution, um, but Things like fire suppression and dust control. We do have dust control within the system. Water isn't really. We don't. We don't. It's all dry processing that we do. Fire suppression is a big thing, but generally, what we find with any of our customers, we don't have the opportunity to specify the fire suppression. It's the customer's insurance company that will specify it. Now we can supply it, you know, as part of the full solution, but it's usually driven by insurance companies specify what what system has to be used. So usually we install the plant with whatever dust control measures that the customer requires and, and then the customer will take care of the, the fire suppression equipment. So yes, it is, it, it's required in the UK and it is becoming more and more prevalent as we hear, you know, quite often you hear in the news about fires at, at waste sites in the UK. So it's, it's, it's a hot topic at the minute, excuse the pun. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, actually, we don't have uh, any active questions at the moment in chat session. Uh, in case if there is uh, no question, uh, you are really welcome to uh, write uh, all you would like to, to know more in email and we will forward it to our speakers. Uh, last call for the question. So, if not, thank you very much, Deborah, uh, Darren, Kenny. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for being with us today. Uh, please, if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, to uh, to feel to drop us a line. We are always happy to help. I hope this uh, webinar was uh, useful, and uh, there are some some. Uh, ah, there is a question. Uh, do you use uh, Fandomite. I'm actually not really sure what is a fandomite. Uh, do, do you know something like that? Fandomite? Doesn't ring any bells to me, no. I will try to Google it. <laughs> Machine. Oh, it's um, it's automatic container acceptance. No, we don't. No, I haven't heard of it. 
I think that you have. Oh, oh, yes. it's, it's, like, it's like a reverse bending machine. I don't think yeah. there. I know Scotland. We're talking about introducing something like that, but I don't think it has UK, been implemented. Scotland and England are both committed to looking at um, introducing deposit return schemes, and the reverse ending machines might be part of that. But that's still being looked at. Mm. It's under discussion. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you very much. As I said, uh, feel free to drop us a line and have any other questions. Uh, thank you and uh, see you next time on our future events. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for organizing it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers then. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.